Hello and welcome. I'm Sydney Bieber, Public Affairs Specialist at Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District. And before we get started today, I have a few quick housekeeping items. If you're joining us on the Mid-Pen website, you'll see there's a poll with a few quick questions. We'd love to know if you've visited Ravenswood Open Space Preserve before, or if you've hiked or biked along the San Francisco Bay Trail. If you're watching this on Facebook, Go ahead and uh, take the link below and uh, you can answer those questions for us. Also, following our virtual preserve tour a little later on, we'll have time for a few questions. So feel free to submit those to us either via the chat on Facebook or in the form below the live stream on our website. If you're watching in full screen, you'll need to reduce your screen size to see the questions. And now I'd like to welcome General Manager Ana Ruiz. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hi, Sydney. As Sydney <laughs> noted, I am Ana Ruiz, General Manager of the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. I am delighted to have you join me and the Mid Pen team virtually today as we celebrate the opening of the newest segment of the San Francisco Bay Trail at Ravenswood Open Space Preserve a project that has been 15 years in the making. At MidPen, we have always understood the importance of connecting people to nature and to the outdoors. Over the past six months, as we all do our part to keep each other healthy during these unusual times, it has become even more apparent how critical the healing powers of nature are to the, our physical, mental, and emotional well-being. During shelter at home, outdoor open space has remained an essential service and a much needed respite to so many people. MidPen is grateful for the opportunity to provide Bay Area residents with many beautiful and wide open spaces to safely venture out and enjoy the outdoors. And one of these special places is our picturesque Ravenswood Open Space Preserve. Although we are unable to celebrate in person the opening of the new Bay Trail segment at Ravenswood, I would ask that you all take a moment to picture yourself there. If you would like, close your eyes and imagine being surrounded by the low-lying marsh vegetation with sweeping views to the west of the Santa Cruz Mountains. You turn to the east and see open bay water. Occasionally, you notice spits of water jumping a few feet into the air as a wave rushes up against the shoreline. In the distance, movement catches your eye. Looking up, you see a pod of brown pelicans flying across the bay toward the Dumbarton Bridge. Your gaze then travels inland along one of the sloughs where you see a spot of brilliant white along the bank. And you realize you have come across a snowy egret in search of food. Meanwhile, you relish in the cool breeze and take a deep breath of moist, salty, fresh air while enjoying the warm rays of the sun on your back. You welcome the soft sounds of nature, a barn swallow chirping in the distance, the gentle wind blowing around you as you hear each footstep along the new wooden boardwalk. Part of the wonder of Ravenswood is its ability to ignite all of our senses, sight, sound, touch, smell, and taste, as you take in the scenic views. To help instill the beauty and the calm of this wonderful Bayfront Preserve, we have put together a short video to give you a preview of what is awaiting when you visit Ravenswood. Take another deep breath and enjoy.
Aren't those views just breathtaking? This Bayland Preserve This Bayland Preserve is truly one of our special places on the San Francisco Bay Peninsula. That this land was once a working pond is not, and is now thriving habitat for countless shorebirds and other wildlife is a remarkable testament to what we can achieve when as a community, we invest in nature and in our local environment. At Ravensburg Preserve, we invested in expanding access to nature within close proximity to many neighborhoods within the city of East Palo Alto and the Belhaven community of Menlo Park. As people stay close to home during these times, it is gratifying to provide a new connection to the Bay and to our region's panoramic tidal marsh landscapes that is within easy walking and biking distance to so many homes. As you enter the preserve, you subtly escape the commotion of the built environment and are immediately surrounded by the serenity, expansiveness, and natural splendor of the bay and tidal marshlands. The easy access paved trail provides opportunities for users of all physical abilities to immerse themselves in this unique bayland ecosystem. The new 0.6 mile segment of the Bay Trail establishes an astonishing 80 miles of continuous Bay Trail access, linking seven cities to the Bay and to each other, from Menlo Park to the north, Santa Clara to the south, and even out to Newark and Fremont to the east via the Dumbarton bike path. The new segment connects Ravenswood Preserve to University Avenue, where a new trail had these visitors onto a beautiful wooden boardwalk stretching over the salt marsh habitat and wetlands to reach a raised levee trail that leads to two spectacular observation decks overlooking bay water. With this new segment of trail, bicyclists can now travel along a dedicated safe pathway for miles, enjoying the bay trail for recreation, or commuting along some of the most picturesque corridors in our region. In this way, the new segment also helps to promote a sustainably green, low carbon transit option that connects people to major employment centers located along the shoreline, including the headquarters of Intuit, Google, and Facebook. Along with facilitating bicycle commuting to reduce the number of cars on our roadways, and lower our collective greenhouse gas emissions, this project is also enhancing climate change resiliency for local wildlife. While building this new segment of trail, MidPen took the opportunity to further protect our bayland wildlife from the impacts of climate change. Wildlife such as the endangered salt marsh harvest mouse and Ridgeways rail. The project includes new refuge islands that rise above high tides and the projected increase in sea level to provide these animals a safe place to hide under cover from predators during flooding events. MidPen's project manager, Scott Reeves, from our engineering and construction department, and natural resources management specialist, Karine Tukatlian, will next take you on a virtual tour to share a behind the scenes look at these habitat enhancements and the sensitive approach we took to protect the unique natural resources at Ravenswood Open Space Preserve. Great, thank you, Anna, for your introduction and welcome all of you to our virtual tour. Today, we'll give you a sneak peek into the recently completed and now open Ravenswood Bay Trail connection by virtually walking the project site with you. I'm Karine Tokatlian, and I'm a biologist with the district, and I will be discussing the plants and the animals that live in the tidal marshes at Ravenswood and the work that we at MidPen did to protect them during the project. Hi, everybody. I'm Scott Reeves. I'm a landscape architect at MidPen. I was responsible for the management of construction, and I'll walk you through the trail features and what we did to build them. Our Ravenswood Open Space Preserve is the dark green area um, in the map here, and it's also marked by the red star. And it's located in a tidal marsh along the southwest portion of the San Francisco Bay. It's roughly 380 acres in size, and it's a great location for bird watching and easy access walks, as Anna described earlier. Because the preserve is centered in the peninsula's urban corridor, 
It provides a really wonderful local connection to nature and an opportunity to relax and breathe in open spaces. And it offers an experience that's a little bit different than the rolling grasslands and forested canyons that are found in many of our other Midpen preserves. The habitat at our Ravenswood Open Space Preserve is predominantly tidal salt marsh. And lush marshes like this once ringed the bay, but unfortunately today, only about 10% of those original marshlands remain because they were developed and converted to other land uses over time. These native wetlands provide a very important buffer for high tide events, and they also protect us from rising sea levels. And they also provide essential habitat for a wide variety of animals like crabs, shrimp, fish, birds, and mammals, including two endangered species, the Ridgeway's rail and the salt marsh harvest mouse. The Ravenswood Marsh is also interchangeably called Cooley Marsh sometimes, and it was converted to a diked salt pond in the mid 1900s, and it functioned as a salt production pond for several years. And in 2001, it was restored to a fully tidal landscape. So now, bay water can actively flow in and out of a rich network of sloughs and channels, and this allows the marsh to continue naturally rebuilding itself using that fresh tidal water as it comes in and the sediment that comes in with it. Before we start our walk, I want to briefly describe the overall extents of the project. We improved all 1.4 miles of existing trails within our Ravenswood Preserve, shown here in purple, and we constructed a 0.6 mile new trail segment through a neighboring property that connected our preserve to a new trailhead at University Avenue. This new trail segment consists of boardwalk shown here in blue and asphalt shown in green. It connects 80 continuous miles of the Bay Trail and it really brings us one step closer to ringing the Bay. Because we know this will become a bicycle commuter route, the trail will be open from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. daily. And there are automatic trail gates at both the Ravenswood, or sorry, excuse me, both the Bay Road and the University Avenue trailheads to open and close the trail daily. Throughout the project, we removed ADA barriers and converted most of the trail to meet our easy access standards. With the challenges in property rights, environmental constraints, and physical barriers, there really are no easy trail projects left in the San Francisco Bay shoreline. And this location was no exception. The project, 15 years in the making, was ultimately successful because of a few guiding principles. The first principle was a collaborative approach with our partner agencies without whom the project would not have been possible. The second was that we needed a very light touch on the land. A common theme you will see throughout today is the narrow work zone afforded to our contractors when working in the marsh. And although challenging, it helped to minimize our temporary and permanent impacts and facilitated permitting. Another example of our light touch is our elevated boardwalk, which has an extremely small footprint relative to its overall size. And finally, we really had to approach this project with never-ending optimism, which allowed our team to overcome challenges and reach for the finish line. One of the largest challenges we overcame was how to design and permit the project in such a way that it could be built during the winter months so as to not disturb the endangered species in the marsh during their breeding season. The Ravenswood Marsh is lush and rebuilding, and it currently supports a lot of different wildlife species. Two endangered wildlife species were particularly considered during the construction of this project, the Ridgeway's rail and the salt marsh harvest mouse. Both are known to occur in the marshes at Ravenswood. And as Scott was describing earlier, in order to protect these animals during their breeding season, a seasonal work restriction was strictly followed. Project construction in the vicinity of the marsh habitat was only allowed to occur between the narrow window of September 1st to January 31st. The first species of particular concern to us was the Ridgeway's rail, uh, recently renamed from its former title Clapper Rail, and it's a medium-sized shorebird that forages and breeds in pickleweed marsh habitat. So it really spends the majority of its life and is very dependent on the kinds of tidal marsh habitat that's found in Ravenswood. It's also sometimes called the marsh chicken because it sort of looks and moves similarly to a chicken. So if you're out there and you think you're seeing a, chi seeing a chicken in the marsh, um, it might be a rail. It has a long downward curving orange bill 
And overall, the body is brown in coloration uh, with different patterns on the back and some barring on the sides. Ridgeways rails are often secretive and we tend to see them, uh, we tend to hear them before we see them and their call sounds like a series of sort of consistent grunts or claps. And I have an audio clip here to share with you. So after hearing that clip, it might be understandable why this bird is called a clapper rail um, because it makes that consistent clapping sound. These birds are widespread in the marshes of Ravenswood and they were actually observed by our experienced biomonitors during project construction work at a safe distance away from the work. And during their nesting season between February and August, Ridgeway's rails create a cup of vegetation that they sort of nestle in the marsh vegetation near the upper high tide line. Unfortunately, this species has experienced extreme habitat loss because again, nearly 90% of its native marsh habitat in the San Francisco Bay Area has been removed or altered in some way. And so as a result, unfortunately, it is listed as both federally endangered, federally and state endangered. And this is why it was very important for MidPen to be mindful during our project work and to reduce and mitigate any impacts to the rail's existing marsh habitat. The second species, um, it was also essential that we protected marsh habitat during construction because of the second species of concern, the salt marsh harvest mouse. And this is a small nocturnal rodent that also forages and breeds in dense pickleweed marsh habitat. So it's very heavily reliant on the kinds of, of habitats that are found in our Ravenswood Open Space Preserve. Its scientific name, Rythrodontomys raviventris, literally translates to groove-toothed mouse with a red belly because they do indeed have grooved top teeth and a reddish, uh, reddish brown bellies. So if you're ever fortunate enough to see one of these uh, animals that close in person, you might note some of those characteristics. They are well adapted to living in marsh habitats that are fed by daily tidal flows and they can actually swim for up to two hours, which is uh, pretty incredible for a small animal of this size. This species is limited to the salt marshes in the San Francisco Bay complex. Um, so they occur both in our Southern areas of the San Francisco Bay and they occur up in the Northern reaches as well. When they breed, they also build nests uh, made of vegetation or placed uh, tucked into the vegetation close to the ground level and hidden in the marsh. And like the Ridgeways rail, the salt marsh harvest mouse has lost nearly 90% of their native tidal marsh habitat in the San Francisco Bay complex. So as a result, it is also listed as a federally and state endangered species. Starting our tour at the preserve trailhead, let's now walk north along the levee trail that encircles the Ravenswood Open Space Preserve and talk about how this portion of the project was constructed. As Karine mentioned, all the work I'm about to talk about is within our seasonal restriction window. We need to first cross the existing Ravenswood Bridge to get into our preserve. And as we do, I want to highlight that this bridge only has a nine foot clear width and a five ton weight rating. That means anything wider than nine feet or heavier than five tons cannot use this bridge. And as this is our only access point into the preserve where we needed to pave 1.2 miles of trail, this would prove to be our first obstacle. For reference, a fully loaded asphalt truck can carry upwards of 25 tons of material plus the truck weight. So the contractor decided to optimize the paving operation by changing out the existing bridge for a construction bridge with a 20 foot clear width and a 75 ton weight rating. And I think we have a video that shows this. Uh, As I mentioned, we set off to pave 1.2 miles of levee trail around the Ravenswood Marsh. The levee offered a narrow work zone with little margin for error. All construction activities started at the furthest point from the bridge all the way in the north so that the contractor built their way out. And with no turnaround locations, the contractor had to back up their vehicles 1.2 miles to deliver materials to the construction site. The average backup time for a fully loaded truck was about 30 minutes. 
All the paving work was completed successfully under the supervision of biologists, geotechnical engineers, and MidPen staff. The paving work was completed by the January 31st deadline and the preserve reopened on February 1st, 2020. The final product is an asphalt multi-use trail that is 10 feet wide with two foot natural shoulders on each side. In each direction, this trail leads you to a wooden observation platform right at the water's edge. Great, thank you, Scott. And at this point in the tour, we are still on the Preserve Levy Trail, as you can see in purple on the map here. And now we're in the Northwest section near the intersection of the new and the existing trail. Uh, so we're standing right at that red star. So let's look east over the tidal marsh toward the San Francisco Bay. And I just wanna first take a moment to uh, talk about how the marsh functions and what that means for wildlife. So during high tides, the marsh floods with water and wildlife like the Ridgeways Rail and the Salt Marsh Harvest Mouse are pushed up to higher ground in order to escape those, those rising water levels. Wildlife then become exposed during these high tide periods and are more vulnerable to predation unless they can find some kind of cover or vegetation to hide underneath. So they seek this refuge under native shrubby plants like marsh gum plant and patches of continuous vegetation in those high ground, high elevation areas, again, in order to stay safe from predators. Two types of wildlife mitigation were constructed as part of this project and that relate to this marsh function. The first were enhancements to transition zones and a transition zone is um, the area on the side of the levee uh, that's that sort of slopes down and is between the highest point at the top of the levee trail and the lowest the, the lowest point um, at the lower lying salt marsh. So plants grow in this gently sloped area on the side of the levee and water usually does not reach this high uh, during high tides. The second type of mitigation were high tide refuge islands and these were also built further out into the marsh and away from the preserved levee trail that we're standing on currently. I'll talk about more of these, I'll talk about these in more detail, but um, I, I wanted to say that both of these areas provide that high ground refuge for sensitive wildlife species like the rail and the mice during those high tide events when waters inundate those lower areas of the marsh and they're seeking refuge in order to stay safe. Three transition zones were enhanced along the east side of the Preserve Levee Trail. And this large photo shows one of those transition zones. So we're essentially standing in the middle of it. And again, we're on the side of the levee as it slopes gently down toward the marsh on the right side of the photo. And you can see the, the highest point at the, the top of the levee trail on the left side of the photo. About 1900 linear feet of this area was enhanced and these areas uh, lie about three to five feet above the high tide line. And again, they have gentle slopes that are easy for wildlife to move in and out of as those water levels change. Enhancements included uh, removing non-native weeds that were growing there before we began the enhancement, uh, plants like mustard. And we also planted native plants like marsh gum plant and salt grass. And the goal of the enhancement was uh, to establish dense patches of native plants like shrubs, forbs, and grasses that our native wildlife like rails and mice are adapted to using in order to stay safe. And the, the smaller photo inset shows our wonderful contractors planting some of those native plants like uh, marsh gum plant and the salt grass. So before I show you the second type of mitigation, let's see if you can find uh, a high tide refuge island for yourselves in the Ravenswood Marsh. And if you selected that small tiny speck of dark vegetation that looks a little bit taller than everything else in the marsh, uh, you're correct. It might not look like much to us, but imagine yourself as a small mouse or a bird navigating this vast expanse of marsh as the waters are coming in. And this island, this high point is everything to you and your survival. Two high tide refuge islands were created by hand out in the open marsh. And again, these were areas that were about two to 300 feet away from the preserve levee trail that we're currently standing on. They each measured about 10 feet wide by 25 feet long. 
And there was a, a really interesting process of creating these islands. So the first step was to walk out to where the island was going to be constructed in the marsh and to actually remove the top layer of vegetation that's that was currently growing in the marsh. So to re remove the vegetation, the roots and the the healthy mud that was sort of intertwined in, in between those roots. So to remove that layer and set it aside. The next step was to collect mud from a nearby channel and to use that mud to build a mound, uh, which was essentially the body of the new island. And finally, the last step was to take that layer of vegetation that was set aside before and place it back on top of that new mound of mud, essentially capping it almost like a, a vegetation blanket. Um, and then finally, more native plants like uh, marsh gum plant were planted on the top of that new island. So over the next several years, those plants will continue to grow and continue to create healthy refuge for wildlife, like the Ridgeways Rail, during high tides. And these islands sit a few feet above the average tide levels that we see in our Ravenswood Marsh. In order to reach these locations uh, and to do it safely, Temporary plywood sheets were used to support not only the people walking out there, but also the lightweight equipment that they carried out with them. Uh, so this photo shows a temporary, one of those temporary paths leading to a refuge island construction site. And the plywood sheets were used not only to protect the actual vegetation in the marsh from getting damaged, but it also prevented the formation of trails that uh, a predator might key in on and that would lead them directly to that new island. So once the island was constructed, we removed that temporary path and those sheets are now um, completely out of the marsh. All right, from this junction where we're standing, looking out over the marsh, let's now turn west towards University Avenue. We will head out of the Ravenswood Preserve now and onto a trail easement on the San Francisco Public Utility Commission land. This is where our elevated boardwalk begins, which was designed to protect the marsh accommodate for sea level rise, and offers the perfect vantage point to watch the wildlife. You can observe an impressive variety of birds from the new boardwalk vantage point that Scott just showed us. Um, the San Francisco Bay sits on the Pacific Flyway and it is a critical stop for migrating waterfowl and shorebirds, like these long and short-billed dowagers that we see in the photo here. You may also see very large flocks of birds resting or foraging or flying together like these marbled godwits because birds in the San Francisco Bay can number up to 1 million individuals at the height of this migration along this important flyway. Our Ravenswood Open Space Preserve also provides habitat for species like Western Sandpipers, Scop, and Northern Shoveler to name just a few as they rest and build up their fat reserves to continue their journeys or return to their back to their breeding grounds. The bay is also home to many species of breeding and resident birds like the American avocets seen in this photo here. And avocets can be easily defined by their long upcurved bills and their black and white patterned backs and wings. And when these birds are ready to breed, their heads will actually turn to this lovely rusty brown color. Um, so be sure to keep an eye out for that when you're at our Ravenswood Preserve. Blackneck stilts also breed in the bay and they can be seen at Ravenswood foraging in the mudflats and channels, especially during mid or low tides. Forester's terns like this one can be seen flying overhead, maybe even carrying a fish back to its young waiting at the nest. And you will probably also see a variety of herons and egrets navigating the sloughs and channels looking for their next meal. So we are truly pleased that preserve visitors can enjoy a beautiful array of wildlife from the Ravenswood Trail and our new observation points at any time of year. Great. Let's focus now on how the boardwalk was built through the marsh habitat. As the first order of construction, temporary exclusion fence was installed on the exact footprint of the future boardwalk. The exclusion fence acted as a protective barrier that prevented salt marsh harvest mice from entering our work zone. Exclusion fence was roughly three feet tall, made of smooth plastic material that mice could not crawl up. It was tucked into the soil, supported by stakes, and crimped over at the top to make absolutely sure that no mice entered into the work zone. 
The fence and work area were monitored, reg monitored regularly by qualified biologists to ensure that the protected species was not harmed during construction. And we're pleased to report that we had zero incidents with wildlife during construction. Once the exclusion fence went in, temporary matting was installed to support the construction activities over the soft mud. Each day, the work zone was cleared by our biologist and then the team of contractors, equipment, inspectors, and staff carefully moved out to the site via the narrow 10 foot wide access route. 242 cedar posts were installed between 24 and 26 feet deep to support the boardwalk. Yellow cedar was used because of its ability to withstand the corrosive salt conditions without preservatives or chemicals that would otherwise harm the ecosystem. The posts were vibrated into the mud using a mini, a mini excavator and I think we have a video of what that operation looks like. The boardwalk was constructed from east to west, slowly building out of the tidal marsh and into the upper grasslands, never expanding outside the footprint of the final structure. The design and permitting team anticipated that the repetitive equipment movement out and back over the marsh would eventually create a, dep a depression in which a tidal channel would form underneath the boardwalk. This was fully understood through shade and hydro hydrology studies and fully explored with our permitting agencies. Once the posts were in place, much of the structure was fabricated off-site to minimize the risk of construction debris entering into the marsh. And once our cedar structure was in place, the contractor began to build the decking and guardrails, which are constructed of locally available redwood. The contractor continued to provide meticulous housekeeping practices by setting up tarped cutting areas to keep all of the sawdust out of the marsh. The final product is a boardwalk that is over a thousand feet in length or nearly one fifth of a mile. The boardwalk is exactly 14 feet above sea level and this height was determined in collaboration with our permitting agencies to adapt to sea level rise. The boardwalk is 10 feet wide with three overlook areas with bench seating and educational panels. Carefully tucked into the boardwalk is a prefabricated steel bridge. The bridge is supported by a concrete abutment on each end. And each one of these abutments sits atop four steel beams that were vibrated into the ground over 40 feet in depth. And although the abutment work lies just beyond our seasonal restriction zone, we still needed to exercise great caution in how the steel beams were driven into the ground, especially because of the amount of noise and ground vibrations that could be generated. And similar to our boardwalk posts, the only acceptable installation method was to vibrate the beams into place. Here's a picture of the eastern steel beams successfully installed to depth and ready for the concrete abutments to encase them. Once the abutments were constructed, the bridge was brought onto site in two pieces. It was assembled and craned into place. This work was all done under the supervision of our biologists and structural engineers. I think we have a sped up version of the bridge being placed. The bridge is 86 feet long and it spans across this federally mapped tidal water body. So to do a quick map check, uh, we're now at where the red star is. Um, we've crossed the new bridge and uh, we've exited our seasonal restriction zone. We've got about another 150 feet to walk on the boardwalk before we reach our trail transition to our 10 foot wide asphalt surface. Consistent with all the trails we've walked so far today, this trail is fully ADA accessible, easy access trail. It's marked with traffic striping and signage to facilitate safe bicycle commuter use. 
The trail is located on the shoulder of an existing San Francisco Public Utility Commission service road, and it is still within the easement I previously mentioned. We've now reached the west end of our construction project, and this is the new trailhead at University Avenue, where there's an automatic gate that opens and closes daily. From here, trail users can turn north and they can stay on the existing Bay Trail to head towards Highway 84, or they can turn south and use the newly constructed crosswalk and sidewalk to reach the University Village neighborhood or head into East Palo Alto. So that concludes our walk today. And I wanted to take a quick moment to thank all of the designers and contractors who, in conjunction with our MidPen staff, provided the boots on the ground to deliver this project. The project was designed by Calendar and Associates, BKF, Biggs Cardoza, and Parikh Geotechnical, and H.T. Harvey and Associates. The trail was built by Granite Rock Construction Company, and the restoration work was done by Hanford Arc. Permit support was provided by H.T. Harvey, and ins inspection support was provided by Cuesta Geotechnical. All of these firms embody MidPen's mission to protect and restore the natural environment and provide opportunities for ecologically sensitive public enjoyment and education. Thank you, Scott, and thank you to everyone who contributed to this project. So with that, we look forward to hearing your thoughts as you enjoy the new trail connection and I'll turn it back over to Sydney. Thanks guys, that was a great tour and I really feel like I was there. So before we uh, jump into a couple questions, I wanna share some of the results that we had from our question. It's a little small here, um, but it looks like uh, almost 65% of the people who answered have been to Ravenswood before, and you probably all feel like you've been there now, so maybe that's 100% now. And uh, I think that it looks like even more of you, about 73% have um, bicycled or hiked somewhere along the San Francisco Bay Trail. So here's a new connection that you should check out and take a look at next. And I do have a couple of quick questions that have come in. And uh, the first question, I think for Scott is, how do I find the new neighborhood entrance? Oh, that's a great question. So the new neighborhood entrance is off of University Avenue. And so as you're traveling on University Avenue, north towards the Dumbarton Bridge, after you pass Purdue, it's on the right-hand side. Great. And a good thing to note is that that is an entrance for walkers and bicyclists. There is no parking at that location. So if you're looking to drive to the preserve and park, you'll still want to go to the Bay, uh, the Bay Road entrance, and we have parking there. And then the next question I have is uh, for Kareen. That is, what is the best time to go and see wildlife? Oh, absolutely. Um, the best time to see wildlife, it, generally to see birds, um, is in the morning between, I would recommend between the hours of nine and noon. Um, and that, that still applies to Ravenswood Open Space Preserve as well, um, because those hours are also more pleasant in terms of lighting and weather. Um, so if you're wanting to visit our wildlife, if you're wanting to visit Ravenswood and uh, observe wildlife, I would recommend between the hours of nine and noon. Great. And uh, Scott, someone is asking, where do you source yellow cedar from? It's a good question. So our yellow cedar came from British Columbia and pretty much anywhere in the, the great north, um, you can find uh, yellow cedar. So from Alaska to British Columbia. Great, and I think we have time for one more question. And Kareen, how did you get the mice out before you built the exclusion zone? It's an excellent question. Um, we were incredibly mindful and careful uh, in terms of our biological monitoring approach during this project. So our wonderful consultants um, were very experienced bio biologists and not only did they uh, monitor the work site every day during work uh, activities, they also checked the work site prior to work beginning every day um, before work began. So they were meticulously checking to make sure that there were no uh, mice or other animals at risk of being disturbed or injured in that workspace. Um, all of our contractors were also given thorough environmental education um, trainings before they before they began work. So everybody who worked on site was aware of uh, what the sensitive resources were and how to make sure that they stayed protected. 
Great. And I'm going to go ahead and invite Anna back here to join us. Thanks so much for answering all our questions. Sure. All right. Thank you, Scott and Corrine, for that fabulous guided tour. I think we all learned a lot more about the project and about the preserve. And thank you also to the participants for the excellent questions. This project was first envisioned in 2005 as a pathway to connect multiple communities in different cities to their local Bayfront parks and open spaces. Today, I am proud to recognize the Ravenswood Bay Trail Connection Project as a prime example of how MidPen works collaboratively with many partners across our region to pursue ambitious and impactful projects that benefit our community and our local environment for generations to come. We share today's opening celebration with the many agencies that played a critical role in realizing this vision of connectivity and access. As the saying goes, many things take a village. Well, this little trail segment took what at times felt like a whole universe, including more agencies and organizations than I can count with both hands to receive all the necessary approvals and funding support. This includes two cities, two counties, a local public utilities commission, a regional planning agency, five state agencies, two federal agencies, and one open space district. Many of our partners are joining us online today and we want to thank each and every one of them for their dedication to this project. First, I would like to recognize the San Francisco Bay Trail with which we work closely on the trail design and the alignment. An essential partner has also been the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission with which we entered an easement exchange, providing the final piece necessary to assemble the property rights for the trail connection. Ravenswood Preserve and the new Bay Trail Connection lie at the border of two cities, East Palo Alto and Menlo Park, both of which have been a part of the project since the early planning days. The California Natural Resources Agency is one of several important funders awarding the project over $1 million for trail construction through its Urban Greening Grant Program. This preserve and the project also lie at the border between two counties, both of which allocated generous grant funding for the design and permitting. $1 million from the County of San Mateo and $400,000 from the County of Santa Clara. Facebook is also a key partner, providing $300,000 for trail construction as a part, part of a unique private-public partnership to support an important community asset that also benefits local businesses and employment centers located along the shoreline. The California State Coastal Conservancy and Association of Bay Area Governments, also known as ABAG, provided the initial $40,000 in seed funding to begin the planning process and create the momentum to get things moving toward actual implementation. Caltrans provided $700,000 in funding to construct the public access improvements. And finally, we thank all of you who, as a community demonstrated your willingness to invest in nature. By voting yes on Measure AA, MidPen's open space bond in 2014, voters provided the capital funding to complete this work. Funding that we have leveraged many times over through partnerships and grants to protect and preserve our fragile Bayland ecosystem, to restore vital wildlife habitat, and to connect neighborhoods and cities to nature and to the thriving San Francisco Bay shoreline. A few of our key partners and supporters shared their thoughts with us and we've compiled them in a short video that we would like to now present to you. Because this is the only Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District Preserve on the Bay, I'm especially pleased with the completion of this project that connects visitors and residents to bird watching hikes on an uninterrupted 80 mile stretch of the Bay Trail. Thanks to the generosity and foresight of voters who approved Measure AA, Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District was able to be the lead planning and funding agency to bring the Ravenswood Bay Trail to completion and more importantly, to the public. 
Hello, I'm State Senator Jerry Hill, and I'm delighted to celebrate the opening of the Ravenswood Bay Trail with all of you. This small but mighty segment is an important link in the 80-mile Bay Trail that connects our communities to nature. I'm so pleased that the state of California was able to provide a $1 million urban greening grant in support of the Ravenswood Bay Trail. This is very exciting as we continue to ring the bay. Hey everyone, Assemblymember Mark Berman here. I know that during the last couple of months with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've all come to appreciate even more uh, the amazing open spaces and trails that we have here on the peninsula where we can get out, get some exercise and stay physically distant and stay safe. And I want to congratulate MidPen for the uh, soon to be completed section of the Ravenswood Bay Trail, which will create additional access for the communities of Menlo Park and East Palo Alto to the Bay. And I can't wait to get out there and, and, and enjoy it as soon as it's complete. This trail has it all. It closes a critical Bay Trail gap. It offers access to the Bay for residents of East Palo Alto and Menlo Park. And it provides a venue for wildlife viewing and environmental education. The San Mateo County Board of Supervisors invested $1 million of Measure K funding into this project. And we're sure glad we did. Hi, this is County Supervisor Joe Simidian with a big congratulations all around on the Ravenswood Bay Trail uh, project. Uh, you know, this is a reminder how much more we can do when we work in partnership with others. This is a long-term project, it's a big picture project, and it is a reminder that persistence pays off. It is a way to connect the various communities in the Bay Area, uh, and it means more than ever, in my view, in, uh, when we start to talk about the importance of connection. So uh, yeah, it's a great trail connection, but more than that, it connects all of us as part of one larger community, and that's a good thing indeed. Congrats all around. I'm Laura Thompson, manager of the San Francisco Bay Trail Project. Completion of the Ravenswood Bay Trail is a transformative event for our region. This trail completes the last gap in an 80 mile network connecting eight cities across three counties, and it illustrates how the Bay Trail can function as a complete system. The Association of Bay Area Governments, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, and the Bay Trail Project are pleased to have played a funding role in this project including the initial grant that kickstarted the project using State Coastal Conservancy funds in 2005. Congratulations. Closing gaps in regional trails has never been more important to get people back outside into the natural world. For the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, being part of the Ravenswood Bay Trail team has reminded us how environmental stewardship is interconnected with thoughtful recreation, while we provide high quality drinking water to our almost 3 million customers in the Bay Area we're happy to provide perpetual trail easement as part of the project. Enjoy the trail. Hi, I'm Brenda Buxton from the State Coastal Conservancy. The Conservancy provided funding for some of the planning studies that were necessary to get this trail built. What the Bay Trail means to the Conservancy and the residents of the Bay Area is connection. Connection with each other and connection with the Bay, which is, after all, the defining feature of our region. And we really count on partners like MidPen to get this trail built. So we thank you for your perseverance. Access to the Baylands is important to our program because it allows us to facilitate connections to nature between the local community and this valuable ecosystem. It also helps us to talk about crucial issues such as sea level rise and to think about creative solutions to safeguarding our community in the future. Our volunteers love to come out here and see the different plants and animals and birds that reside here at the Baylands.
We are truly grateful for the cooperation and support that these partners have provided. This project and what is now a lasting public benefit would not have been possible without our partners' contributions. Now, the last thing for me to do is to thank all of you for joining in today's celebration and to invite you to come out and experience this special place for yourself. We would love to see you out enjoying the preserve. Throughout August, we invite you to send us a picture of your adventure on this new stretch of trail. And in return, MidPen will send you a starter kit of our fabulous new preserve icon postcards. Please go to openspace.org forward slash Ravenswood for details. As of today, the new segment of the San Francisco Bay Trail is open for everyone to enjoy every day of the week. Bring a sun hat, a good pair of walking shoes, binoculars if you have them, a bottle of water in your camera, and take in the beauty and the healing powers of Ravenswood Open Space Preserve. Happy trails and take care everyone.